the Icons of Real Estate podcast. Are you ready to learn the proven money-making secrets from top producing icon agents? Ready to skyrocket your business? This podcast is for you. Tune in every week and find out how to implement proven strategies to 10 times your business. From $3 million to $30 million in just 12 months. Brought to you by the Masters in Real Estate Marketing, Arter SEO. Welcome to the Icons of Real Estate podcast. I'm your host, Ken Elvin, and today's guest is a seasoned veteran who has seen all the good, bad, and ugly that real estate has to offer. It's this that has made him known for his compassionate approach to helping families navigate their transactions. Former Air Force officer, a qualified mechanical engineer, and five times KW Bowl graduate, he's here to share with us just how he's able to get more out of every deal by adding more value in the process. All the way from Tacoma, Washington, Zach Entwistle. Zach, really good to have you on the show. Hi, how are you? Hey, I'm wonderful. What's, Excellent. what's, uh, dare, I, dare I ask, what's the weather like in Tacoma? It's a little bit overcast, but it's warm. Um, I actually drove my son to school this morning, had my sunroof open, listening to some music. Ah. It was great. No, nah, so is that, is that, is that the sun, uh, the sunroof uh, hairstyle? <laughs> it's just the, I've had the same hairstyle since I was in the Air Force, you know, 20 plus years ago. And, it it works it. for me. I've tried the long hair when I was in high school and it didn't work. So I just, I just have always had the same haircut. Man, I would <laughs> never even try to do long hair because whenever I do, it's it's completely defined. It only grows in the back, and I don't think I can pull off a mullet. I don't think I'm I'm ready no. for that. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. so you every everyone who comes into the show, all of our icons of real estate have a story to tell, and I think you're the best person to tell it. So take us on a on a journey from from then till now. How did everything that led up to you being in real estate? Mm -hmm. So um, I have a very analytical mind. Um, I went to school for mechanical engineering, as you mentioned, um, went to college and did the ROTC program and got into the Air Force, which was wonderful. It was a great experience. And I knew that it wasn't my career path. So I decided I needed to do something yeah. different. And I was really struggling. I was actually uh, working on my credentials to become a teacher. And my girlfriend at the time worked in the school district and she said, you're too entrepreneurial. You're, you would really struggle with the amount of bureaucracy in the school districts. So I started thinking about what could I do? And my mom had owned businesses in the past. And so I thought, you know, someday it might be nice to own a business. Well, I um, didn't really know what that would look like, but I had read a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah. And in that book, he mentions that to be a business owner, you have to have three skill sets. You have to have sales and marketing, you have to have leadership, and you have to have finance. Mm -hmm. And he also goes on to say that you should pick a job that will teach you those skills. And so I thought to myself, well, okay, I've done four years of ROTC and four years as, um, in the Air Force. I've learned a thing or two about managing people and working with people. So leadership, okay, I've got that. I've got at least a handle on that. Let me think about the other two. And I couldn't really see a good transition into finance. Didn't really think of anything that made sense. So then I thought, okay, let's go to sales and marketing. And if my job was to learn sales and marketing, then I needed to figure out some sort of job that would teach me sales and marketing. So I thought, okay, maybe I could sell copiers because Xerox you know, had a great training program at the day, but I didn't really get excited about copiers. I'm not really a consumer of cars or any kind of big type products. And yeah. so I was really struggling mm -hmm. what I could sell. And then I thought, well, wait, I had bought a home and I believe in real estate. And when I thought to myself, I had done a ton of research trying to find a great realtor and the realtor that I hired, she was nice, but she wasn't anything to write home about. And I thought, well, maybe real estate. And I gave that a go, uh, or I, you know, I tried that on and I talked to my commander before um, I left the service. And I said, Hey, before I leave, can I do some research with the guys in my unit? And he said, sure. And so I went around and I talked to the guys in my unit and said, Hey, what was, you know, have you ever used a realtor? If you have, what was the best thing a realtor ever did for you? What was the worst thing a realtor ever did for you? And I realized that there was a lot of need and mm. I saw that it was a job where you could make some money. It's a job where there's need 
Um, and it was also a job where you're helping people transition, which I really liked. And I did that when yeah. I was in the Air Force. So it became a very natural, let's give this a go so that I can learn sales and marketing. And maybe one day I'll own a business. I had no idea that real estate was its own business. I just, but live and learn. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So, so it's, it's safe to say that that experience that you had with that first agent sort of spurred you on and made you exactly the sort of agent you wanted to be. It's, I mean, we've heard those teachings. They just, they're just in a different formula. It's be the leader. You be the leader for others that you, that you wish was leading you management style, anything else. So you've kind of taken that on for, for what you do in real estate. And, and I think that that key difference between, between someone having a good experience and you said you didn't have a bad experience it just wasn't there wasn't anything memorable about it so the difference between it being a good experience and a bad experience and a memorable experience uh where you want to go back to that same realtor that's that's something that has to be pay, uh, that that you have to put attention to what do you do to ensure you get repeat clients yeah that's a great question um and it's a whole bunch of little things right i mean it's one of those things that I'm constantly coming back to that atomic habits idea of 1% improvement, 1% improvement, 1% right. improvement. And you just keep coming back and saying, okay, if I could get it just a little bit better, right? Cause I mean, ultimately we sell two products, buy a home, sell a home, that's it. And so if I can just keep improving that process just a little bit. So one of the things that I do is that I attend every signing, every closing, every escrow I attend. And we make it a big fanfare. So in the beginning of the transaction, we will reach out to the person who's our client and we'll send them a questionnaire called the All About You questionnaire. And we're asking them a lot of questions. What's your favorite snack food? Um, do you drink alcohol? Do you, you know, what is your favorite celebra celebration alcohol? Just a lot of different type of questions. Which people love I use that. <laughs> They do, and because it feels like I'm being customized too, right? It feels like a Ritz-Carlton type experience. So what happens is we take that information from the beginning of the transaction. And then when it comes to closing, we always do the closings in our office, which we schedule with escrow and with a notary. And at that closing, we have a slideshow with all of the pictures, all the glamour shots of the home that they just sold or the home they just bought. So it's going and it's, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. it's an endless it. you know, um, loop. And then we have some celebration music going on. And then we have their favorite alcohol and their favorite, or if they don't drink, then their you know, sparkling cider or whatever their beverage of choice is and their favorite snacks. And we put their name in lights, you know, like we've got a welcome, congratulations. Yeah. Um, I actually had this happen yesterday when my seller came in for her signing and she walked in and she goes, did you call my daughter? Like, how did you know? And she's like, oh, wait, I filled out that survey. Oh, uh, she's like, you just took it over the top, right? So after signing, we all had, you know, a little thing of bourbon and we were able to enjoy and celebrate. And she was like, I've never had a realtor make it such a great experience. And I think the awesome. word on the street is you shouldn't go to signings. And yet I'm going to tell you that's the time that's the time to like finish it out. That, and so she actually, that's where everything video. you've done. That's where everything you've done Correct. is culminated. That's the only time you've officially finished your job. Correct. Correct. Well, yeah. for someone so who says who prides deal. himself on being quite analytical, sorry about that, Zach, there's a little bit of a de delay there. If someone who prides himself on being quite analytical, you've, You've, you've got a lot of fanfare. I mean, that must be quite a sensory overload. I can't imagine not remembering that. Yeah, it's, we make it a party. And I think so often when you go to escrow, your realtor's not there. It feels like you're going to the sterile environment with some stranger and you're signing all these papers. You come to my office, which you already know. You've got your favorite drink. You've got your favorite snack. Yeah. I'm there so that there's no question that can't go answered, you know, unanswered. Like it becomes a really great experience. Awesome. So I'm curious, and uh, and you can chalk it off to, I mean, if and you, you can forgive me if it's a bit of an obvious question, but what is 0% home improvement loans? What are, what are they? And, and how are you using it to help your clients at the moment? Excellent. Yeah. So my niche is downsizers. And um, I really focus that that's my target. So people who are downsizing, people, you know, estates and divorces, like that's the key demographic. Okay. And so our target market 
you know, a lot of times they've had deferred maintenance on their home, right? Maybe they're getting older and they've been in their home for 30 or 40 years and the home has gotten tired because they've just run yeah. out of energy and they don't have a lot of available cash because they're on a fixed income, right? And so maybe it still has the shag carpet. Maybe it still has the bamboo wallpaper and maybe it still has the sparkles in the, in the popcorn ceiling. Wow, and so all of those eight. things, <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, but it's but it's a great home. It's a great mm -hmm. home. It's served this family well, right? And so what happens is that home, when you put it on the market like that, it's going to attract a garage sale type buyer, right? A, a wholesale, a flipper, somebody like that who can say, "I can see the potential." I give this thing a facelift, and all of a sudden, I'd be able to sell it for a lot more. Right. So that's the traditional grandma's house or elderly type home. And so my thinking is we can do yeah. better than that. And so what I'll do is I'll actually come in and I work with the, the sellers and I'll fix up the house for them at cost. So, uh -huh. you know, if it's if the roofer says you need a new, you know, if the inspector says we need a new roof, we get the roof bid and it comes back at fifteen thousand dollars, then I charge them fifteen thousand dollars. Right. And, and when I say charge them, what I do is I pay the money and then at escrow, I just get paid back out of the equity. Yeah. Okay. And I do that at zero interest. Um, and we just take care of all of the little things. And so we're able to get a much higher sale price for the home than they would have if they were to just put it on the market as is seller to do no work type thing. Was well, first impressions definitely matter. And, and we all, any realtor who's been in that sort of situation knows it doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter if those improvements are going to be done. Yes, your buyer walks through the door. You tell them, no, don't worry, that's going to be done. And you know, we're in the process of if it's if they've seen it like that, that's the price point they're stuck on. You're not going to get them through on that imagination process. That's really, Correct. really cool. And 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 I think you're selling yourself short. You almost downsize your own, your own um your own performance there because it's it's not just unheard of to find uh, a not unheard of but it's definitely not a few and far between to find a, a real estate agent who helps uh, helps with something like that I, I have in my own experience found that sometimes the attorneys might want to get involved but that's because the, the market's different in, back in South Africa but it's not just that it's not just a real, realtor is willing to do it realtor is willing to do it at no profit to themselves so yeah that's mm. awesome yeah okay. I run a volume game right so I I think if I can sell a lot of homes and I'll get my commission, then it works out really great. Right. Um, and I do in my paperwork, just so, so everybody knows the paperwork does have a, some languaging to protect me. And so what it says in the paperwork is that the money is borrowed at 18% interest. If the money is paid back at escrow, the interest is waived. And so to date, knock on wood, I've never had a client, Pay me interest. Awesome. I don't want to be paid interest. I just want to make sure that I don't get taken advantage of from somebody who decides, you know what, we really like the home. We're just going to stay and we'll pay you back when we want to. No, that doesn't really work. So Absolutely. yeah, there is some some protection for me. So and and I have to imagine if you if you're ever committing to do something like that, you you're going to be a bit more discerning about the listings you take on. What what steps do you take? before onboarding a listing to know if that's something you're willing to, to take risk on? Yeah, that's a great question. So a big thing is really understanding the motivation of the seller. That to me is the crux of everything, motivation and time frame. And so if I get a sense that they're really not all that motivated to sell, then I will tighten my, you know, my purse strings awesome. really fast and just not do that. There has to be a significant desire and reason for why they're selling right their husband just passed away their hip broke they need to do this they need to do that there i was named in orders in the divorce case they have to sell right those okay. are what i'm looking for and i also need to make sure that there's equity and yes. so when we sit down on our first meeting i do a cma with them so that they can see the numbers with me we do a net proceeds to make sure that they have a like a good amount of equity and I'm not getting close to that yeah. margin number. Um, we order title very quickly to make sure that there's no silent seconds or anything along those lines. And the whole time when I'm talking to them, so this is just my own personal bias, but selling a home is not a fun process. I don't think moving is yeah. fun. I don't believe everybody should do it. To me, selling a home is kind of like going through a divorce. 
right? You do it if you have to, but ideally you hold on to real estate. Mm -hmm. If it makes sense, hold on to it. Absolutely. So I go in really kind of like, have you thought about all of the other options? Just like no divorce attorney that I know is like, woohoo, divorce is the best. You should get a divorce because I need more business. Like no divorce attorneys like that. But if you're going (laughs) to do it, you're going to do it as well as you can. And that's what I think about. So the constant refrain for me is, really, have you thought about, maybe you've got a family member who wants to live here. Maybe you want to, you know, hold on to it. Maybe there's some way we can have you keep it. And they almost have to talk me into why they have to sell as opposed to anything else. And if they can talk me into why they have to sell, then now, once again, that shows a strong motivation. Because if I can talk them out in that first conversation, then they probably shouldn't sell anyways. And that works for everybody. Yeah, and rather rather give them that ex that that out before we invest any not even money money's money's easy you can make more money that time that energy correct I imagine you especially with your analytical mind you're also you're probably taking that list that li- that that property itself through its own little due diligence do you have any sort um, an inspection process that you're you're prefacing it with mm. yeah one hundred percent. Um, and if anybody's curious, you can go to my website, zachintwistle.com. And in the resources tab, there's one called the Downsizing for Top Dollar System. And it breaks down the entire system. So I'd encourage it's a good place to go and just read over it. It's like five steps Wonderful. and goes over it. But yeah, step two. So step one is just kind of getting an overview of the whole process. Step two is a pre-inspection of the home, right? So we're going to take its home through completely through its paces. So we're gonna we're gonna have a structural inspection from the roof down to the foundation. We're gonna have the well looked at if it's on a well. We're gonna have the sewer line looked at. We're gonna have the septic system looked at. We're gonna look at everything. Yeah. Because to me, before we start working on the the outfit of the the home, yeah. we got to make sure that the bones are good and there's not internal bleeding or there's not a raccoon infestation or there's not chewed wires and something. We're about to have a fire or you know Absolutely. maybe the the months, subfloor like of that. the bathroom is going to collapse because there's so much rot from a, a leak from a wax ring that's been compressed. Are, are, so these many just, things. are these just generic examples or any of these part of like a, a horror story you had before? Oh, these are multiple. I mean, we have these happen all the time where you, the client wow. didn't know that there was a roof leak or, you know, like, like I said, there was a family of raccoons and they had chewed through all the electrical and all Crazy. the plumbing. And so it was nasty downstairs. <laughs> you know, down in the crawl space, but how often do you go in your crawl space, right? So we look at the whole thing and that just allows for when the buyer comes into the home, they can look at it both from the, you know, the aesthetic perspective, but also the structural, because we give them a copy of the pre-inspection. We give them a list of all the work that they've done. And so now we know that this is a full product that we can feel really good about. And oftentimes, so we just had one where we put a house on the market. We had 34 offers of the 34 offers that came in, 27 of them, 27 of them waived their inspection because we had done Wonderful. so much pre-work legwork. So it's it works beautifully. And those little those little key things that just speeds up the process. I mean, it means it, it's, it closes sooner, people get paid sooner, everyone's happy. Absolutely. Yep. So I'm hearing more and more more and more often that uh, two and a half is the new three percent. Now we've already said this is primarily an agent agent podcast, so I'm just gonna throw it out there. But I also think I think you can ask for any number as long as you're able to justify and commit to to adding that level of value. So what do you do personally uh, to position yourself so, so that you can ask for more? Yeah, so we typically get so we charge between six and seven percent total. And obviously wow, prices crazy. are always negotiable. So this is not price fixing. Six. So charge whatever you want to charge. So, but we charge between six and seven and of which if we're six and we take three and a half and we give two and a half. And if we charge seven, we take four and a half and give two and a half. Um, two and a half has been the standard buyer commission in our area for a long time. And so because we do so much preliminary work, we don't feel bad about having a disparity between the two because we really make it so easy for the buyer to walk through of and course. the agent to of just course. get paid. So but because I'm fronting so much money and the average spend that I have on a listing is $30,000, um, I've, I've lent as much as $70,000 on a single project. And so when you think about how hard it would be to borrow that money and to, you know, the fees on that, of and course. then to hire a general contractor manager to who's going to oversee and coordinate all of the repairs, Right. It's one of those things that almost becomes a no brainer because 
when you think about how much all of that would cost, when we're charging seven, it's typically the owners are not local. Um, the house is in significant disrepair. So case in point, I had one where the this was a referred by an attorney and the the house was in a state. The the yeah. executrix of the only family member in the in the family who was connected to the home here in this area was back in Oklahoma. So when I walked through the home, as is, it would have sold for about four hundred thousand dollars. So we put thirty thousand dollars into the home, and we sold it for five sixty. So I got my thirty thousand wow. back. The family made one hundred and thirty. They didn't care what my commission was, honestly. Like I probably could have charged ten percent if I wanted. Because I got them one hundred and thirty thousand dollars more money than they would have if Crazy. they would just put it on the market with the really, traditional really cool. HM. Yeah. And that that sort of approach is a no brainer, really. I mean, especially if you're taking yeah. on taking on all that all that from them. Zach, I have to say, I know you you've positioned yourself as the niche. Your your niche is the downsizers guide. I would maybe ask that you consider what really sounds like what you've done is you've found a beautiful way of marrying that analytical head that you have with a really wholesome, hearty, I actually care about the process feel. So, you know, heart and head definitely seems to to be why anyone in Tacoma should be should be referring, I mean, either chatting with you, especially if they're going through boss or any sort of other sort of stress like that where the property is involved or if they've got clients that are that are um, in that position. If, I mean, assuming assuming that's going out right now and there's someone listening and they and they thinking that's exactly what I need Zach for, how did, how did my viewers get in touch with you? So there's a couple ways. Um, you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram. And on there, it's got my banner of all of that, has my contact information. It's also got a link right to the guide. I think the guide is really probably where I would start anybody because the guide is going to walk you through the process. It's got my bio. It's got my contact information at the bottom of every page. So at any point, you can reach out yes. to me. But the guide really spells out how this whole goes goes down. And so if you have a client who's thinking about downsizing, a lot of times they're a little bit nervous about calling a salesperson because they don't want to be convinced into something. Whereas if you go onto my, if you go and download it, you can read it. It's about a, I don't know, about a 15 page document. It's full color. So you can see it. It's not just like a lot of straight text, but it's really well done. I think um, and I say that because I wrote it. So there's a little bit of bias there. But that's probably the best place to go is to just go to my website, zachintwistle.com, and then click on the resources tab and then go down to the downsizing for top dollar. And that way you can read about it, you know, but at any point you can call me, you can Facebook message me, you can Instagram me, easy. There's lots of ways to get in touch with me. Awesome. Well, Zach, I've really enjoyed having you on the show. And I'm pretty sure the next time I have you on the show is when you're going to have broken one or two more records, at least for yourself. And that's kind of a, a good question to leave it off from your side. What is what is next for, for your group or for the for the end whistle team? Yeah. So I just recently hired a salesperson because one of the things that I've been visioning and my business has been growing, I've decided I want to travel more. And so my current vision is I want to be able to leave the country for a week every three months and go see the world. So I just got back from Hong Kong with my boys. I'm planning a trip awesome. to Turkey. South Africa's on the list. There's a lot of fun yeah, places in I can the world that I have recommendations. Been. I love it. So yeah, so my intention is that I want to be able to leave for 10 days and know that my business is taken care of and know that if, a, you know, an attorney refers in a client that needs to go, we can, we can get them all taken care of. And so that's really the iteration of the team does a great job already of taking care of my clients, yeah. um, but just needing to make sure we have it on the sales side as well so that we can close those leads as they're coming in. That's the that's the vision of where we're heading in the next 12 months. But it seems like it's just very upward trajectory and it's really exciting for me. No, I, it, it's exciting. It's exciting to see from our side as well. So definitely I'm going to put you on the list for 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 a, for a return visit sometime in the future. Zach, really appreciate having you on the show. And for myself, Ken Elvin and Icons of Real Estate Podcast and Zach Entwistle from Tacoma, Washington. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. Yeah.